Hi, I'm Carson Block, and welcome to another episode of A Short Story. Today's guest is Herb Greenberg. Now, I think there's going to be some real heat here because this is actually going to be a conversation. Originally, this was going to be an extremely interesting interview, um, but Herb and I, in doing the pre-interview conversation, we realized that we actually need to talk about the state of activist short selling, short selling, financial journalism, um, and markets, and really what people should do when they grow up. And um, along the way, we're going to hear a lot about Herb's background, but this is really, yeah, this is really a conversation because Herb should be introduced as the founder of Herb Greenberg Research, uh, which he announced a few months ago. Um, when he announced that he was going to begin career in activist short selling, but Herb's having some, some second thoughts. And so with that, let's begin this discussion. Herb, it, it all seemed great at the outset, maybe not so much now. What, uh, what's changed? Well, it, I think what's changed is, is it's not so much that it's changed, Carson. It's that now that I'm doing it, um, I've noticed that there's, you know, it's not quite what I expected in terms of idea generation the same way. And being the sort of entrepreneur wannabe that I am, the very impatient person that I am, um, it's given me time to think, to treat some of this almost like it's a sabbatical and to sit back and think, okay, what do I really want to do here? Well, you know, who am I? Because let's not forget what I did. I was with a subscription research business that I started back almost seven years ago with Don Vickery, and and then we brought in Linda McDonough as our analyst, Civic Square Research. I gave that everything I had for for, for nearly seven years, 24/7, working vacations, working on cruise ships, going across the Drake Passage, publishing on those ships. Because when you have a little business like that and you have a few dozen subscribers, you've got to deliver. They're paying you a lot of money. That was sort of the pinnacle of where I'd come in my career. And I was really enjoying it. I like running a business. You know, there are people who like to administer and there are people who like to, 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 to do, right? So I like doing the research. I like doing the writing. I was the, the voice of this. I used to write everything we had. But every month we had to sit down and go through our list of subscribers. Who's still here? Who's coming up for renewal? And I might, that which would immediately get my, 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 my anxiety going because you have to start thinking about, oh, are they going to renew? Aren't they going to renew? And then we had to go through the books. My wife would sit there with me and we'd go through it and we're like a check and balance system. So I go through all that. There was a metamorphosis in my life, a very important change that for most people would be the change, but it was a change coincident with other things, and that was my heart surgery. So in March of last year, March 4th of last year, a Wednesday, um, I was in Cleveland having heart surgery. They opened me from here to here, it was nine inches, they went inside, they tinkered with four different things. I got a valve job, a new aortic valve, I got it, what's called an aortic root, I got partially a new ascending aorta, and while they were at it as a bonus, they found I needed a little bit of a bypass. So they did one single bypass of sort of a wayward artery in the back of my heart. It was a fabulously successful surgery. I was in shape for the surgery. It was a great journey. It was actually, it was like I viewed it as a, as a first person journalism experience. I went into it with no fear. I had the best surgeon. I interviewed the surgeon before the, uh, before the surgery, because uh, the day before, because I was working on a piece on a company called Abiumed. We were working on research on this company, Abiumed, which went straight up on us, just another one that went straight up. But I was very curious, so I had one of the best surgeons in the, in the world with me who really knew this stuff very well. I wanted to interview him about the product that they had. The day before I had an, or two days before I had an angiogram with a senior interventional cardiologist before they gave me the juice. I said, hey, I got, to, I got to interview. I got to ask you a few questions. Asked him about Abiumed. So I used it as a really interesting experience and I got some good information, by the way, on Abiumed, not that it mattered. Um, I thought it was good, but it, it didn't seem to matter. And then I went through the surgery, I was in the hospital for eight days. There was a mild complication, nothing major. Flew home 10 days after surgery, was sitting at my desk on the 11th day working and um, 
We flew home to COVID. We landed at LAX from Cleveland in lockdown. Totally disrupted everything. Who knew it was going to happen at that point in the cycle with our business? Because the business was everything. And so you start, you know, you watch what's happening. The market crashes. You go, oh, this is amazing. But wait a second. And then the market takes off. Now, for months, you're throwing everything at the wall to try to get the attention of your subscribers. And everything you're doing isn't working. Things that look like they might work, that would seem like they're going to work, aren't working, Carson. And I sat there, you know, we're all working as a team, trying to come up with things that are going to work. And suddenly you're feeling toward the middle of the year, to the end of the year, you're feeling irrelevant. Everyone's got not just, look, I've got heart surgery that had happened. I had a successful recovery, but now we're in COVID. It's locked down. You're worn out. Thinking of new things to do with the business. I couldn't figure it out. Turn into the new year. I thought, surely, surely the market's going to correct here. And we continued to just, it was really a challenge. So finally, I just said, guys, I've had it. And I started to think about new things to do. So I did an interview with Dan David, your friend, Dan David. I don't know if he's still my friend. And so, <laughs> really, I'm just kidding, of course. So Dan says to me on the interview, says, why haven't you gone into activist short selling? I said, well, Dan, I didn't want to go to activist short selling because I've always been concerned about the litigation. I prefer to almost be under the radar as I was for the time I was with Pacific Square. He goes, oh, but you know, I was in the subscription business. So he starts talking about it and I started thinking about it. And I actually was able to get my head around the concept of litigation. So what I did is I went out to a bunch of people I know, but whose opinions on activist short selling, I didn't know. And I started giving sort of, you know, you know, there's a half dozen people, started asking them, what do you think if I went this direction? And to a one of them, they all said, why wouldn't you do that? Why, what's taking you so long? What, what's, what's holding you back? And I thought, well, that's crazy, because I thought each one of them would say it was the stupidest idea they'd ever heard. And then I started calling some activists I know, including you, because now I'm thinking about, should I do this? Who would I do it with? What would I do? So I call you. You spend the first 10 to 15 minutes telling me why you think it's the stupidest thing I could ever consider. And you really, you went through this whole concept of saying, almost like saying, are you out of your mind? We started talking and I started getting more interested in this concept of, of taking the diligence because I had seen what was going on out there and I saw there was so much diligence. And I can do diligence, I do research very well. What do I have to lose? I could either be a success, a failure, or something in between. And I like trying a lot of things. I take a lot of risks with my career. I've done almost everything I can do with my career. You know, even going back to once working for an arbitrage firm, I've tried it all. So I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring. Um, my team at Pacific Square, Don and Linda, did not want to go down this road because they probably were a little saner than I am. And, uh, and so they, you know, decided to stay with the business. So I basically left the business that I started and it was a very hard thing to do. And now I'm doing this and now I'm thinking to myself, okay, now what? And so that gets us to where I am right now. So the reasons I, of course, told you that you should really think about this. Um, I mean, I've had these conversations with lots of people over the years because from the outside, I think what we do can look glamorous can look easy oh, you're moving markets and you come and come to this with a lot of built-in advantages that the vast majority of people who try to get into activist short selling today do not have i mean name and recognition reach i mean you've got far more twitter followers than i have but you know the 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 stresses of this business especially with respect to litigation well it's not it's not litigation it's just it, it's funny, maybe this is because I've, I have a more dour personality than the average person. Um, you? <laughs> yeah, but um, I found that this is a business when you never really can stop and smell the roses because um, it's really exciting at times working on these projects. You know, and I mean, it's like juices are flowing and you're finding the key stuff and you know you have the goods. You go public in like inshallah stock crashes but then you start thinking 
Now, look, and I've, I've, I'm in the room with my team and you know a lot of them are kind of doing like touchdown dances. That's never me because I'm thinking like, you know, well, how long am I going to have to be looking over my shoulder? Like, how's this sh going to come back at me? The better you do, the more concern you have. The worse you do, the more concern you have. From a psychological perspective, this is never a, you know, like it, this is just never the kind of business where you're, you really let yourself experience the joy. I, I, I think that's like really the kiss of death. No, the issue is, is actually a little different. And I've noticed, I think the hardest part of this so far has really been idea generation. It's, it's very different than I think any traditional short uh, would, would experience. And while I've been a journalist and I've been a researcher, um, I think that I know enough people in the business and I know how this works. I have a guy working with me um, who's a seasoned short analyst. He's been around a long time, just a little younger than I am. Uh, well, actually, a decent amount younger than I am, but it doesn't take much. And he, he is, um, you know, even he's found it very difficult. And when I start to do an assessment of what's really going on in the world of activism, there's part of me that says, well, you know, either I'm a year too late and or I'm a year too early and that my timing is off terribly. And maybe the reality is, is what I was seeing when I was at Pacific Square where there was a it was getting harder to find good ideas that were working. You know, you're thinking these are fundamental shorts, right? As opposed to activist shorts. And, but there was also, I noticed that, you know, you looked at what was going on in the end market, right? The end market was shrinking. There was a lot of, it was becoming narrow. It was always a narrow market. It was becoming narrower. Um, the AUMs of our, of, our, of our subscribers, many of them would complain they're coming in. They would just say, we're not sure. They would literally say, we're not shorting stocks anymore. And that, to me seems to be a part of what actually helped activism from the outside, where the network was part of it. Because look, one of the things I think is, what I've noticed is, I think that activism, the success of activism in recent years changed the perception of what a good short is. And I think what happened was, is there are people over here who like ice melters. They want companies where there's a business model that is slowly going to decline. It's going to generate alpha. It's not exciting. No sex appeal whatsoever. No one talks about it, but it's not going to hurt the hedge funds portfolio. Now you have those over here, which by the way, some of those aren't even working the way they should work, but they're over here. But then there's there's the sexy short that everybody, one of the reasons people do this, it's kind of exciting, it's kind of fun. You're finding things, you're finding people who are misleading, misrepresenting, you're finding all sorts of stuff. You're watching it out there and you can out it. And I think that that created the perception of what a good short is. And I think a lot of that would come from traditional short sellers who would do the work and in the process of doing work that they'd start maybe by the numbers and there'd always be i remember i used to talk to short sellers and i'd say where did you get that idea they say it was right in the numbers now when they were right in the numbers meant they started in the numbers but in the process they started talking to people and they often would find it was considerably worse than anyone ever expected the numbers were just the reason that got them into it and then as they started talking to formers or they started doing this research and that research and talking to competitors and suppliers they found this thing was really a, a bigger bag of garbage than anyone would have ever expected to be. And then they, they do back in the old days. Remember, I transcend this. I transcend this by pre-internet years. When I started at the San Francisco Chronicle with my column in 1990, 1988, it was a very different era. And so they typically would, there would be a bunch of single stock journalists out there, people like me. and short sellers, the traditional short sellers who would find the equivalent of what you might call an activist idea, would look for ways to catalyze them. And that's where the, the journalists would come in. And they would share the ideas with people like me. Now, some people would say, hey, those guys are using you. But I wrote a daily column in San Francisco. I wrote six days a week for 10 years. I was looking for ideas. I was using them. But what I always had to do was I had to confirm the information, Carson. I had to go out and I had to re-underwrite or re-report the story just to get make sure something was correct because it's usually a little nugget of something. That was the way things were catalyzed back in the old days. But then think about what was happening. 
journalism was changing, the internet came on. Things just started to change. People started taking matters into their own hands. You know, there are people who would call me. I remember when I was a journalist and there was this one very aggressive short seller. And she called, I had two assistants working with me and they were working on some stuff with me. And she called and she said, when's he gonna do that story? And I said, you tell her it's none of her goddamn business when I'm gonna do that story because we're doing our thing. You started to see after the internet came along and people started to get comfortable with it. You started seeing people, you know, creating their own blogs, you know, in the 2000s, short sellers going direct, as I call it, uh, starting to, you know, get more aggressive in their own rights, taking matters into their own hands. And then you started seeing, you know, you know, Andrew came out, Andrew Left came out, you know, Stock Lemon doing his thing before it became known as Citron Research. You know, Andrew started carving out a niche here and doing, he was one, really one of the pioneers in this. And then things started to evolve. And I think the activists, then you came out with Sino Forest and it was like, what, you know, literally, you know, that was a knock the cover off the ball moment. It started to create the perception over the years, certainly in the past few years, of what is really a good short. I'll never forget one of our subscribers saying to me, Herb, we're not going to we're not going to stay with you because we're changing our focus on shorts. From now on, all we want is frauds. And internally we said, they want frauds. Has anyone looked at Wirecard before it became Wirecard? It blew, you know, it sort of blew up everybody. I mean, that, what kind of a strategy is that? And I think what he meant was they were looking for ideas that had hair on them. They wanted that, that extra something. And I think you started to see this change. And so now, but that change came by people could talk, talk instead of talking to me, the journalist, or me, even the stock researcher, who was underground. Remember, I was under the radar at Pacific Square Research. They were going to you and they were going to other people like you. And that created this whole model. Now what I think I'm seeing is I'm seeing, I think what I've seen at Pacific Square, I think that network has kind of quieted down. And because I don't think as many people are doing the research, they're not shorting the stocks, which means more companies are getting away with murder, but you'll never know it because the way you can't, what I found frustrating about this is we're sitting out there looking for ideas. Mike is doing it the old fashioned way, the way he's been trained. I'm doing it the way I know but when you're starting to sit here and say, hey, let's go through SPACs, let's go through IPOs. It's like you're turning over cards. And you know, when I'm doing it, I'm looking, well, all right, all right, who, who ran this company? Who runs this company? And you're starting to, you know, you're doing this kind of work and you're looking at it. No, I don't have time for this. Move on, move on, move on. Something may catch your attention. I think that's a terrible way to find ideas. I think it's a ridiculously, not just is it a hard way, it's looking, for, I call it looking for a needle in a haystack uh, method of looking for ideas. And that, to me, it may work for a certain way out on the spectrum type folks who enjoy doing that. I like collaborative work. I like figuring something out. And I love moving on. And, um, and so I found that process not to be, it's not fun. It's got me rethinking what I want to do. And that's where I am today. Let's, but let's really home in on the idea generation. The way that I have been asked this question numerous times by potential investors, um, how do you guys do idea generation? Do you, on well, media too, do you screen? We do not screen. And this is the way, so part of this was based on us and it's not necessarily applicable. Um, you know, I think everybody like kind of finds what, what works for them. But I said, I don't think that we should invest at Muddy Waters in top of the funnel um, capability. So, you know, the funnel, this is here at the bottom of the funnel, this is what you actually publish. And the reason for that is we get pitched, you know, or we got pitched a lot of ideas, um, usually long short funds that were short things. And the vast majority of those were not interesting to us. But we got pitched a lot. But then we, we also generated a lot of our ideas internally, but it wasn't through screening because you know, my take is with screens, you just get a lot of false positives and a, false, a lot of false negatives because you, you lack context. Now, I went and visited with uh, another activist short seller who has been around a long time, um, a couple of years ago, and he's somebody who believes very strongly in screening. And so we sat down and you know, he's, he's showing me his different screens and his process. And he's somebody who's very process driven. I have to give him a lot of credit for, for that because I am, you know, I'm not somebody who systematizes things well. And, 
it works for him. Um, he, he would find things that were anomalous. Um, he had hired a team of analysts who were not, they didn't have a ton of experience. Uh, most of them didn't come from investing, but they were, they were kind of processing things at a lower level. So we'd say, okay, this is what popped out in the screen. Go take a look, you know, spend two days reading through everything and come back and explain to me what's going on that's caused this to pop out or is it unexplained? Now for us, when we generate things internally, a lot of it is what's too good to be true. So this is where, you know, and not to bust your balls, but <laughs> well, whenever somebody says that, right, they're about to do what they say they're not doing. But okay, you've been at this, I mean, as a journalist, as a researcher, a long time. I've got to believe you have pattern recognition. And so my philosophy has been for years that once you recognize that there's, you know, that once you recognize the pattern, you know, you're almost certainly, if you're good, and I know you are, you're almost certainly right. So then it's a question of, okay, how far do you have to go to prove it? Now, you say that that process is not fun. And this is maybe where personal differences come into play. But to me, that's what I was talking about before, where I get the most joy is, you know, we're going at it, going at it, going at it, you know, turning stones over, thinking of new stones to turn over. And then all of a sudden, boom, when we get it after all the hard work, and then things usually build on that. And to me, that's what's really exciting. And look, the Sino Forest was different because it was so f***ed up. And yeah, we were given a roadmap, but I had, so, you know, Sino Forest was a real dip, was a real change in the business model for me because up to that point, it had been myself and a few other researchers and I was doing all the primary research. Sino Forest, we scaled up the team and uh, my three native Chinese speakers, one was a lawyer, one was an accountant, the other was an entrepreneur. They pushed their desks together. They were going through the Chinese government filings. Then I had an entrepreneur, you know, who speaks Chinese, but is not native. Um, you know, and he, his desk was right in front of mine and, you know, another team member and then me. And I was doing some of the primary research, but man, I got to tell you, like, I knew at that moment, or I knew during that project, and we worked hard. I mean, it was physical exhaustion, physical exhaustion, because we were trying to crank. And even though, uh, and I got and like, when we published the report, by the way, just left the building, it was like two or three in the morning in Hong Kong, and just too tired to even watch the stock. Like nobody cared. We just had to go home and get to sleep. That's how hard we were working. But up to that point, I mean, I knew that it was the best time I was, I, you know, I, I would ever have in my career because it was new, but all the discoveries. And to me, you might call it a needle in the haystack, but that's what turns me on is when you find the needle because almost but all you had a lead right. on Sino Forest. You had a lead. You had you didn't just pick Sino Forest out of thin air. You had a lead on Sino yeah, Forest. I'm talking about know. finding a needle in a haystack, Carson, where the needle in a haystack is literally looking at company, 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 trying to find something in this one company in many, many, many companies trying to find the one. And I think that's the hard part, because one thing you can do, Carson, is you can get on with the experts and look or try to find formers, right? One thing I didn't count on, this is God's honest truth, is how difficult it would be, even working through the expert networks, to find people who will talk. So it's increasingly, when I was working at Pacific Square, the crazy part was you'd call people and they wouldn't talk to you because they say, I work with the network and we, we couldn't use experts there because for compliance reasons. Now, I have access to the tools, except it's hard to get people. So you could be sitting there because you can waste amount, an enormous amount of time waiting to get somebody who might talk, who might have the information. Okay, so that's, but so you mentioned SPACs before, and that's yeah. an interesting dynamic with these SPACs because obviously so many of them are f***ed up, right? It's like, oh, no yeah. way, but can you prove it? Now, the difference is between, and we did, so we we shorted this one SPAC that's basically like, you know, empty box called Excel Fleet several months ago. It's done well, but 
I had, you know, I had a kind of a hard time with the report format because this was just based on discussions with former employees, basically. Now, normally, we have a lot more that we're doing. We're doing accounting analysis. We've got government records. Maybe we've got photographs and, and things like that, but in video. But here, it's just the thing was a pipe dream, and we had former employees, you know, for the most part, seconding that notion or really expounding on, you know, how it was a pipe dream. So I'm, I'm known for writing lengthy, detailed reports. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, man, this is going to be like a five, six page report, you know? And if we do that, I know the criticism is reflexively going to be like, oh, you know, Muddy Waters didn't really do the work on this one. That's why it's so short. So I thought, all right, let's change up the format. Let's do slide deck. You know, like you get more slides that way. And, and you know, look, it, the report was reasonably well received from a market response perspective. But what I did sense out there on social media was uh, a lot of people thinking that we really gave short shrift to the research because there's not that much in this type of company into which you can sink your teeth. But contrast that with what has been bread and butter for short activists up to this point. And that is companies that actually do something and have footprints. So that is the problem with SPACs uh, is that you're almost with these recent SPACs that are pipe dreams. You're almost entirely reliant on former employees. Whereas if you look at, you know, let me give you an example. I mean, this was one of the worst shorts ever. Mm -hmm. There were dynamics that made it that way, you know, where we internally had um, a front running problem. Um, and I think that's what honestly, like altered the entire course of the short. But I used to say, or I've said for years, um, best research we'd ever done was American Tower. So American Tower is a company, it's a REIT that they, they buy cell phone tower portfolios often off of mobile network operators, then they lease them out. And uh, it's been a great business in the US, but American Tower, when we did this in 2013, it had, um, it had aggressively within just a few years pushed into Latin America, Africa, India, you know, there, there were just, there were just, signs okay like you know on the surface okay nobody can go pedal to the metal that hard in that many places from strictly operating in the u.s developed market and do this without really f***ing some things up the best interpretation we ended up having of american tower was it was just basically running a carry trade it was like a hedge fund it was borrowing cheaply here in the u.s and then investing in high yielding economies where they you really would have been better off buying the sovereigns but the point that I'm getting to is this. We looked and we, we did this analysis early on of the average price paid per tower. So you look at the tower portfolio acquisition prices divided by the number of towers. And there was one that jumped way out in Brazil. And the company had surprisingly few disclosures on this. Didn't even, dis didn't even discuss who the seller was. We talked to IR, not as muddy waters. No, we don't disclose that. Well, so then we we spun up lawyer in Brazil whom I'd met, who was somebody who really, like the, the fraud and corruption in Brazil really, you know, chapped her ass. She just asked a few people in the telecom industry, like, oh yeah, right away, the, the seller is this company site sharing. And this is what they got per tower, but that didn't match what American Tower had reported. Um, basically what American Tower reported effectively paying in you know, uh, dollars per tower, they'd really paid in reais per tower, which was a much lower uh, price. You know, we, we just kept, you know, we just kept digging. We got records from, uh, we got, you know, foreign exchange records that backed this up. And then the craziest thing was when we, um, you know, we did some pretexting and we interviewed um, a former American Tower regional executive who, you know, <laughs> like told us what they paid per tower, which was down here. And when asked, well, why does it say this in the filings? Yeah, I was like, I, I can't, I really can't tell you, but I, I know. And, and like Bingo. those moments, like we knew, and it took months. And that's the thing, you know, I think you come out of, you, you come out of this business where, and to me, this is one of the really unattractive aspects of the business model that you were in. You know, you're on this treadmill, like you're sprinting, you're constantly putting stuff out. Okay, this business of activist short selling is really, you know, it's really feast or famine. 
and the, the famine periods are long, then you know you do well. And I mean, I had these years, like 2013 was one, I mean, because we spent so much time on American Tower, which sucked. We made our year on the second project of the year towards the very end, um, NQ Mobile. 2014, I was distracted by litigation and shit like that with my you know former partners. Um, we made our year at the end of the year. And like in a way, you know, and I'm not shining your rifle here, right? In a way, I'm a little envious of you because you have the opportunity to focus purely on research, purely on the research and writing. Okay, I run, a, you know, a fund. I've got all of these other aspects of my business that I have to pay attention to that have nothing to do or very little to do with researching short ideas. Now, it's you know, it's the path I've chosen and. For the first few years, I wasn't making more money doing it this way. Now it is somewhat more remunerative. But I mean, to my mind, again, maybe this is just personalities. I'd say embrace that, man. Like spend the time, like look for the needles in the haystack. And yes, the SPACs are tough for that reason. But I, the, the thing is there- well, there's, there's, there's something else, Carson. Mm -hmm. there, I think, look, there's several things. I think that if you asked me where there, and I focus on mostly domestic, that's where, where my focus is. And you've had a lot of success focusing in non-domestic. And I think you've been able to, uh, there's been a great inefficiency there. And I think that's that's been to your benefit and others who focused on non-domestic. In domestic, I believe there's probably this level of um, classic activist names in an area though that may not be as profitable for activism. It would have been good stuff when I was a journalist. It's sub one billion. It doesn't trade very much. Some of it may be a liquid. And you know, some of the best names I had back in the day when I was the columnist were names that never would see the light of day today because they didn't have the eyeballs. They couldn't get the eyeballs. They never would have gotten the eyeballs. They, they, and, and no one the, the editors wouldn't let you keep hammering away at those names, yet they were outing frauds. But, but look, that's a viable model if you wanted to go that route. Right, right. it's nickels. And, but if you're looking at it from a financial perspective, it's a nickels and dimes perspective no, because it takes, no, no. it takes as much time to do a little company as it does to do a big company. Well, except these little companies are more f***ed up. They give it up to you a lot more easily. And I can tell you, like, I don't want to, you know, overstep here, but I know some of these uh, activists who've been in this smaller stock world. Yeah. I mean, these dudes are pulling down like low seven figs, um, in a decent year, you know, like maybe even, you know, I mean like two, 3 million in some cases on these little piece of names because they do give it up to you more easily. And, you know, from that perspective, they actually don't take as much time They're, You know, the, the, the issue that when you and I spoke that I always got in, you know, from, from you with that, and maybe I'm misperceiving this, but I mean, you have this huge brand, right? Like I said, I mean, and you know, I mean, CNBC was, you know, you were there for many years. You look at your Twitter followers, you were doing stuff that was as a journalist, very upmarket. I think you would absolutely kill it in that you know, billion, like you could even say a billion five now because like, you know, like a billion is the new 200 million in, you know, in today's day and age. I got the impression that you came at this from perspective of rightly so, that your brand is up here. Right. right? And you don't want to go down here um, because your brand is up here. Now, the goal of a lot of these guys is, you know, they start lower, they start here, and then they work their way up. Um, or hope to. And um, I don't know, like, I don't think it would, you're Herb Greenberg, right? I don't think- Le I'm Herb you to Greenberg, a here. legend in my own mind. <laughs> you're a legend, man. Like, come on, you know, everybody knows but, you. But you know, it, that only takes you so far and the work you do, and I do my work my way. And my way is, is, um, is, let me tell you something. We were working on a piece recently. We spent weeks on this, weeks. Very interesting idea. Talk to formers, did the work, didn't have the hammer, didn't have the hammer. We identified it, the stock was here. By the time we were working through our work in the course of several weeks, stock was already down by 50%. We're sitting here, we're trying to get formers to talk, we're trying to get certain other people to talk. 
And along comes another activist, writes on the company. Carson, it was garbage. And it was garbage because, A, they didn't have half the stuff we had, which would have made it th that, even though it still didn't have a hammer, would have made it that much better. I looked at that and I thought, and then the stock didn't really budge on it. And, I, and I, it started to move. You know, it's been moving down. There's been other issues at the company. And I looked and I said, that's another thing that's concerned me here is I see some of this stuff and I don't know if it's because people are so sort of desperate to do ideas that they're taking second tier ideas and they're doing stuff with innuendo and, you know, stuff that I don't like, that I couldn't do. Because one thing I always thought about when we were talking about litigation is I always thought I couldn't write something if I didn't know, if I couldn't vouch for it, if I didn't know that it was really, I could say, yes, this is, we could write this, even if it was opinion, that it was steeped in such good, you know, elements of reporting that you know it, could, it was in this, it was irrefutable. But now I see some of this, and I've seen it all along. I've seen, there are always people who come out with stuff, and I wonder how they get, you know, and I look at some of that, but then I look and you, you know, when you're front run by somebody on something, and you know, maybe we'll still get the hammer on the name. Maybe the hammer will present itself next week, and in two weeks, I'll be reporting on the very same name with something that really, really has impact because we can show it is what makes it a great activist name. I asked you something once. I said, let me ask you a question. Because I look at these and I say, I still sometimes see, like when Mike's doing his work, the guy works with me, and he comes up with some interesting names, but they're fundamental. And I once said to you, I said, God, man, I, I wish there was an activist light model where I could still publish for the world. And you had a great comeback and you said, the problem with that is that anyone can argue the other side of a fundamental name. And that the difference is with an activist name, it's, oh my God, I didn't know that. And that's what people pay attention to. Those are the really great names. And if it's a name people care about, it's even better, right? Um, I still sometimes am frustrated, and it's again, it's part of who I am, seeing these potentially great ideas that aren't being outed, that they're either, they're either under the radar in a subscription service, um, possibly, but they're things that I, you, just, you just, as a journalist, you just wanna, you wanna just share it. And you can't, because there's no model. There's no, the, the activist, the, the, the balance sheet model, any of that stuff doesn't work with that. So it's among the frustrations and the things I've learned in the past, you know, the past few months as I go through this process and try to figure out which direction I want to go.